Nick Wright is wrong once again when it comes to Jordan and Isaiah. He just can't get it right. He refuses to get it right. <sighs> so once again, I got to correct the record. But before I do so, make sure y'all hit that subscribe button. It costs you nothing to hit this button. You feel me? It costs you nothing to hit that button. You understand? Know and make sure you put all your people on it. You understand? Know so they too can put it on something. I am your homeboy, Perk. Let's get into it. If y'all missed it, y'all. <sighs> the beef continues between the great, the great Isaiah Thomas and the GOAT, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Uh, recently, Zeke said that this beef between him and Michael Jordan is going to go on for a long time until he gets an apology, a public apology, from Michael Jordan for uh, his portrayal uh, in The Last Dance, okay? I'm paraphrasing here, but he says he was watching The, the Last Dance with his family and say all of a sudden he saw Mike talk, talking about how he hates him and um, how he's an asshole. And then Zeke said, well, and then he, I, I watched the rest of the documentary. You know, it was all Jordan being an asshole, you know? And Zeke like, shit, I'm from the west side of Chicago, so this beef gonna last till I get an apology. That's fair. That that's fair. These men clearly two alphas, two absolute greats. Now y'all know Michael Jordan; he is undoubtedly the gold basketball player, by the way, too. Uh, but I love Isaiah Thomas. I do love Isaiah Thomas. I love his swagger. Um, I love what he's done for the league. A lot of subtle stuff that he do, that he's done for the league, y'all. You know, they talk about how the Pistons really moved things forward in terms of how players travel, for instance. They were the first ones to get their own private jet and stuff like that. Uh, and he's just been very, very instrumental behind the scenes with a lot of, like, the uh, union stuff and all that kind of stuff, so. Zeke a real one, man. I love Isaiah Thomas. And so I wish this beef would come to an end. I wish they would have a sit down like Magic and Isaiah had. But I don't know if, if a public apology is what's going to be needed. I don't know if Mike is going to do that. Okay. But let's get to Nick Wright. Y'all know Nick Wright. Uh, Quite possibly is LeBron James number one fan. Again, as I've said before, I think Shannon Sharp kind of acting with some of you know to, to have that dynamic against Skip Skip Bayless, who is undoubtedly LeBron's number one hater now. Skip got that shit. Even though I think deep down Skip loves LeBron too, but I don't know. But Nick Wright thinks he's right when it comes to LeBron. He pull out all his numbers and he calls himself a basketball historian, but he clearly does not watch the games. Because in his reaction to Zeke and Jordan's latest, uh, the latest uh, revelations in this beef, he thinks that the reason that Michael Jordan doesn't like Isaiah Thomas is that out of all the greats, Isaiah Thomas is the only one that got something over him. What? He says that because unlike Boston, which beat Mike in, in the 80s, during Mike's er, the early part of my career, unlike Boston, which was a super team, he claims the Detroit Pistons was not a super team. This is what happens when you don't watch the games. I've watched every second. I've watched every dribble of the Bulls versus the Pistons in the playoffs. I watched them all. 
Okay. I watched Mike in the Bulls fall to the Pistons in 88, in 89, in 90, and I watched them sweep them in 91. I saw it all. And you know what I learned? The bad boy Pistons were more than just physicality. The bad boys Pistons, some great basketball players. But you got to go watch the game to know that. See, the bad boys don't have, uh, see, you got, with the Lakers, you got Magic and Kareem and Worthy. Kareem, who already, before he got with Magic, had him a goat case for what he did in the 70s. Okay. Then you got Magic Johnson, who came into the league with such fanfare off of what he had done in March Madness in college, him versus Bird, okay? Six, nine, point guard. And then you got James Worthy, who won a championship at a blue blood program like North Carolina. And he comes and you put that together. Ooh, glitz and glamour of L.A., all right? Then you got the Boston Celtics where you got that legendary front line of Larry Bird and Kevin McHale. And you got Robert Parrish. And then, oh, you got Bill Walton off of your bench. Oh, and you got Dennis Johns. You know what I'm talking about? He's also a Hall of Fame. So you got just all these guys, right? Ooh. And they said Boston, legendary, legendary franchise, okay? But then in Detroit, folks want to act like they were just a bunch of scrappy-ass guys surrounding Isaiah Thomas. But you got to watch the games. If you go back to the 1988 playoff series, you'll see. Look at this roster now. He boy nine deep. Everybody's solid. Everybody's solid. Nine deep. Isaiah Thomas. Can I offer you Adrian Dantley? I'll get back to Dantley momentarily. Joe Dumas. Bill Lamb Bill. John Sally. Benny Microwave Johnson. Dennis Rodman. Rick Mahorn. James Edwards. Now. All them names you probably heard, okay? Because you hear that uh, uh, Benny Johnson, the microwave, he light things up, okay? You know about Dennis Rodman, Worm, you know my rebound and, and the uh, ultimate defender back then, especially, okay? Uh, you heard of Joe Dumas, but he gets slept on. He's a two-way player, okay? You heard of Lamb Bill before make Lamb Bill out like he just was knocking folks out, like he wasn't a stretch five at the time, okay? Uh, and when I say stretch five, he, ain't, he can shoot the three, but he ain't getting that many three ball attempts, but he's stretching it uh, for perimeter jump shots for real, for real. Okay. John Sally, uh, a great role player. Okay. Think about a guy who can get things done like a, a think about like a JaVale McGee. Okay. Maybe not as the athletic as JaVale McGee, but you know, it's about a guy that can be effective in playing that role. Okay. Uh, Rick Mahorn, think about his physicality, but James Edwards was a motherfucker. But you wouldn't know that if you didn't watch the game, okay? And when I say he a motherfucker, I'm talking about he was an offensive option for them, okay? Just an option. I ain't talking about his numbers wild you or anything like that. But go watch him versus Dave Corzine. You they tell me who you take it. Dave Corzine, who Mike had this him. Come on, man. Well, let's get back to Adrian Danley, who was on his 8-8 team. Adrian Danley's in the Hall of Fame, y'all. So on that 8-8 team alone, you got Isaiah Hall of Famer, Adrian Danley Hall of Famer, Joe Dumas Hall of Famer, Dennis Rodman Hall of Famer. You got four Hall of Famers on that team. There ain't no super team. What the hell, Nick Wright? Nick Wright want to call the the, uh, the late 90s Bulls super team because he want to throw Tony Kukoc in there as his Hall of Fame. And knowing that Kukoc got in the Hall of Fame based off contributions to basketball internationally as well. But you okay. But D boy got four Hall of Fame. Now they ain't no super team. But let's look at closely at Danley. Danley don't get the credit he deserved as a ball player. Adrian Danley, y'all, for his career, averaged 24 points a game. That boy was a bucket. A bucket, especially when he played for Utah. Okay. 
Devil is my numbers in Utah, okay? 28, 31, I'm rounding. 30, 31, 31. A bucket, okay? 27, 30. The, the, so the year before he came to the Pistons, he averaged 30. Now his numbers went down because, of course, you're going with a scoring point guard like Isaiah Thomas, okay? But they had a guy on their team who could go get you 30. And if you go watch the game, you will see in that series, he was giving the Bulls the work. He could go get a bucket and he could go get to the free throw line. But Nick Wright, don't watch the game. Clearly. Okay. You try out that next year. In the year after that, 89, when they faced off and then 90. Dantley is gone because Isaiah Thomas and Dantley were butting heads, okay? You know, again, Dantley was a guy who could go get 30, but now he's with this scoring point guard who's the face of the franchise. They butting heads. They both want the ball. We know this story. Zeke uses his power to get that man traded. Who does he bring in? He brings in one of his best friends, Mark Aguirre. Okay? Mark Aguirre. Let's look at Mark Aguirre. Because Mark Aguirre has a Hall of Fame case himself. Now, he averaged 20 points a game for his career. But he did what you want people to do, which is sacrifice numbers, sacri sacrifice individual stats and individual accolades, for team success, and he's been penalized for it. Cause check out what Mark Aguirre did in his years prior to joining the Detroit Pistons. Rookie year average 19, next year 24, next year 30, next year 26, next year 23, next year 26, next year 25, okay? So then the year he got traded uh, to Detroit, he ended, when he was with Dallas, he was averaging 22. When he got with Detroit, a more stacked team, his numbers went down to 16 a game for a total of 19 points a game that year, okay? They won a championship. This man was doing numbers. And if, if he had just stayed with Dallas and just focused on putting up numbers, he'd probably be in the Hall of Fame right now. Them two years prior to joining Detroit, he was all-star both years. But joined his homie in Detroit and won two championships. And folks want to act like he couldn't hoop. They don't even mention his name when they discuss no title team. They just say Zeke, Joe Dumas, and they say Ben and Michael Wade Jones. And forgetting that this motherfucker here was giving you numbers too. Come on, man. I take that off the bench. 16 and another 14 off the bench. And he felt like I got to sacrifice the starting role to let Worm start because this motherfucker here give us something different, different. With his energy, his athleticism, his ability to guard so many different people, and, of course, his ability to rebound the basketball. But Mark Aguirre gets shitted on. But since you can't go to basketball reference and see Hall of Fame next to his name, then Nick Wright, man, he, you know, he can't hoop. Okay? So you got a guy who you can argue sacrificed the Hall of Fame to win championships. Okay? And Mark Aguirre. A guy who, if need be, can go get you 25. You add him to Isaiah Thomas. Cause that's the homie. So now you got rid of Danley, who probably the better score, but they button heads, so you increase your chemistry. You still got a guy that have need be go get 25. Okay. And Aguirre, add that to his homie Isaiah. You still got Joe Dumas two-way. Bill Lambeer, uh, you still got Dennis Robb. You still got Benny. You still got Rick Mahone. You still got John Sally. You still got uh, James Edwards. You don't have to really sacrifice any of your other talent. The rest is history. Okay? So in those years, 89 and 90, 
You got guys, three of them in the Hall of Fame. Isaiah, Joe, Worm. You got a possible and Mark Aguirre. And then you got Mike over there with still a young, growing Scotty and Horace Gray. Detroit should have won no game. They should have won no series. They should have. So I don't think the beef got nothing to do with no Isaiah got nothing over Mike. What the fuck are you talking about? Not as a player or in team success. Yeah. The beef is because a lot of kids had beef with Zeke. Like I just mentioned earlier, Zeke was like this with Magic Johnson. And then their relationship splintered. Now, some may say it was because of the heated uh, finals that they played and Magic put that thing on them. Others say it was because when Magic caught HIV, that Isaiah was one of those guys who uh, wondered whether or not or speculated of Magic was, you know, was gay. I've read that too. Whatever the case, they had beef for the logs. We just saw them sit down crying and shit and, and reconciling. We know Scotty got beef with Isaiah. Larry Bird had beef with Isaiah. Carl Malone had beef. A lot of motherfuckers had beef with Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah's a hard no motherfucker on that court. I've seen Isaiah still on motherfuckers on the court. I just saw a clip where Clay Thompson was talking about a time that Isaiah Thomas stole on his daddy. And then his daddy, Michael Thompson, didn't do nothing. He just kept on, you know, kept the movie. He said he didn't feel that shit. Isaiah Thomas wasn't on it. It's like he was a superstar, but it's like he was an irritant. Like, got on a lot of motherfucking nerve. But that don't fit Nick Wright's narrative. That don't fit his narrative. So, once again, I had to correct the record, y'all. The moral of the story is watch the games and get a bad boys their fucking credit. The motherfuckers were great. They weren't just winning championships by knocking folks out the air. They were deep. I saw one uh, game in the playoffs versus Mike and them. Isaiah sat basically the whole fourth quarter, and they still out there rolling. Because they were deep, full of two-way contributors, okay? You might say Worm, probably the only one that was going to hit the court that really wasn't a two-way contributor. But you might say, well, he is contributing two-way because he's going to get you some offensive boards. But let's get the, the, the bad boys at proper credit. Let's not just say, oh, well, it was Zeke and a bunch of guys. There was some hoopers, okay? And let's also hope that this beef one day gets squashed, okay? As I've said before, if Jay-Z can fuck Nas's baby mama and, them, and rap about it, and then one day them boys get over that shit and can have drinks, I think Mike and Zeke can put this shit to us, to the side for the culture. All right? Put it on some. Thank you so much for watching my daddy's YouTube channel. Make sure you like, share, and turn on your post notifications. Okay. How do I do it?